I think it's time for me to start playing a new generation. First of all, I have to say I did not think the technology would be ready to accomplish this in 2023, but because of the extremely hard work of some very talented people, we have been able to pull it off. Thank you Flame Sage, Weil, and Otto, I really could not have done all of this without you. Now I need to make a few things clear before we proceed with this playthrough. When I started playing Yellow, Crystal, Emerald, and Fire Red on the channel, I had a small advantage, which is the fact that I had played those games when I grew up. With Generation 4, I no longer have that advantage. Fire Red and Leaf Green were the last Pokemon games that I played as a child. When the DS came out, it was very clear that my friends no longer thought Pokemon was cool, and fearing social ridicule, I decided not to ask my mom to get a DS so that I could play these games. That being said, I specifically remember seeing the games every time my friends and I would go out shopping, and I would just look at them and long to play another Pokemon game. Now that I think back on it, it's kind of sad that I wasn't able to just pursue my interests how I wanted to, but in the end it's okay because once I was an adult, I realized that I can do whatever I want. It's okay if I'm a grown man playing Pokemon games. So I went on Kijiji, purchased a copy of every single main series game, bought all the consoles, and played through all of the games that I had missed. This is inspired by one of my exes who had seen me playing some Pokemon Yellow on emulator in my spare time. She then bought me a 3DS and Pokemon. Pokemon X, and from there I went backwards through all the games, playing Black and White 2, Black and White, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and then Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. My first playthrough with Platinum was an interesting experience. My entire team ended up very underleveled because I refused to do grinding when the frame rate is 30 and getting into a battle takes like 45 seconds. By the time I reached Cynthia, there was essentially no way to beat her other than using my Gengar, which had Destiny Bond, to knock out every single one of her Pokemon switching to another team member, using a revive, and sending Gengar back in. It was kind of a ridiculous scenario, and outside of that playthrough, I have only ever done one other Platinum run, and I didn't actually finish the game. I often say that I have beat Generation 4 twice, but that's just because I beat Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl when those games were released. Granted, it took me like six months, I didn't find those remakes particularly engaging. So I've given a long-winded explanation trying to say that I have very little experience in Generation 4. Because of that, I have done more research than I normally do when starting a series on this channel, and I'm hoping that these first playthroughs are not going to be too cringy. Part of this research was sitting down and having a chat with Speedrunner0218 and asking him questions about how he approaches the Generation 4 games. So thank you Speedrunner, your advice was very helpful in preparing for this series. Okay, I think we're ready at long last. Let's Let's get into the footage, and as you will see, everything looks very similar to how it looks in all of the other games. We have our real-time resets and badges up in the top left, and in the bottom left we have my Pokemon, its typing, level, growth rate, experience bar, and nature. I have added a little area to display friendship just in case you're curious how it grows throughout a playthrough, and then we have my stats. Notably, there are no badge boosts in this generation, so we don't have to worry about seeing little badges down there and calculating extra boosts. In the bottom center of the screen, you'll see my ability, held item, and then my move set. I'm going to go through it here and explain the abbreviations in the header row. So we have type, move, power, and then damage category, which will be physical, special, or status. If the move doesn't deal damage, it will be lumped into this last category. After that is accuracy, and then finally the most important thing to see in these videos, my PP. On the right hand side of the screen, we are going to see the Pokemon's move pool. I realize this text is very small. If you're viewing on mobile, which most of my viewers do, please use the pinch gesture to zoom in on the video if you need more detail. The reason the text is so small is because I've included a damage category column, and there are also almost 100 TMs in this game, so these move pools get pretty big. And that brings with it good news for this Generation 4 series. Most Pokemon get access to some really good moves. This is the first generation where, to me, move pools really start making sense. They are better in Generation 3, but they're not nearly as good as they are in Generation 4. Now probably most controversial, and you will have noticed this already, I have not included the secondary screen. All of my earlier designs of this overlay included it somewhere on the screen, but as I started recording demo footage and doing some demo edits just to see how all of this 
could fit together. The secondary screen really messed things up, and it actually made most of the footage look much worse. Having elements be asynchronous between the two screens really makes a lot of cuts harder, and all of the information displayed on the secondary screen is also represented somewhere here on the overlay. I hope you can live with this concession, I think it does make these videos look better. I have taken my sweet time doing the introduction of this video. I think now it is time to start talking about the Turtwig line. As a starter, it has a medium slow growth rate, which is fantastic for solo challenges. And for stats, it is a slow Pokemon with higher physical stats. It has 55 HP, 68 attack, 64 defense, 45 special attack, 55 special defense, and 31 speed. It starts with Tackle and Withdraw, and then through Level Up it gets Absorb, Razor Leaf, Curse, Bite, Mega Drain, Leech Seed, Synthesis, Crunch, Giga Drain, and Leaf Storm. Through TM and HM, I'm going to mention what I think are notable moves. Giga Drain, Solar Beam, Iron Tail, Return, Energy Ball, which I will talk about later in this series, Swords Dance, Stealth Rock, Grass Knot, and Substitute. The first battle against the rival gets very close. I played this battle a lot when doing initial testing of my software. You will note that I have missed things, and I'm going to be correcting them as I go throughout these next seven videos. On the right-hand side of the screen, you will notice that I have missed a null check in the enemy Pokemon's moveset. So you can see a couple little question mark icons displayed, as well as the text null, and zero for these two moves' PP values. I'll try to draw your attention to these mistakes as we go. Editing these kind of things out in post takes so long, I would have to go into this battle again, get a screenshot, and then overlay part of that screenshot on that portion of the screen. After all, all these graphics are generated in real time while I play the game. There isn't just a Photoshop document of all this stuff that I can easily go in and tweak. In my testing, what I noticed is that this rival battle is often a loss for the player if you don't use your setup move on turn 1. In this case, because of Withdraw, I had one stage higher defense earlier on in the fight, which allows my Turtwig to survive on one hit point, knock the Chimchar out, and level up to 6. After defeating Barry, I get teleported back to my house, and then I have to go button mash my way through a bunch of dialogue with Cyrus at the lake. Of all the games I play on the channel, this is the one that takes the longest time to really give control to the player and allow them to explore. The first route of the game is incredibly linear. I run into some wild Pokemon on my way, and I'm going to knock them out, because my experience with Platinum suggests that this game is extremely hard. I am going to need as many levels as I can possibly get. After reaching the lab, I have a small tour around the town, and then at the Mart, once Dawn has walked away, I can finally save the game and edit my starter. In these runs of Platinum, I'm going to be using Perfect IVs, Hidden Power Dark, and a Hardy Nature. Of course, I'm also going to be evolving during the playthrough, so these rules are most similar to my Fire Red series. I think this is a nice way to get into the game and play Pokemon in a way that is more close to the developer's intent. After watching a catching tutorial, I can proceed with the next route of the game. There are three trainers here that provide experience, and the wild Pokemon are Bidoof, Starly, and Shinx. By the way, I have had so many requests from one specific person to do a Luxray playthrough, so I guess I'll have to get around to that eventually now that I'm playing Generation 4. I catch a Bidoof because it's a fantastic HM user, and then it takes me a long time to find a Starly. In this grass, it is a 20% chance encounter during the morning and day, and only a 10% at night. On Route 201, it is a 50% chance to catch the flying Pokemon, so in future playthroughs after the little tutorial, I should buy Pokeballs and catch it there instead. After finishing that, I head into Jubilife City and have a lot of dialogue with Looker. This is one of my least favorite Pokemon characters of all time now. He wastes so much of my time during these playthroughs. With him finally running off, I head into the trainer school, talk to Barry, and then fight the two trainers over on the right-hand side. There's more dialogue following this, I have to talk to all the clowns in the city, and then I head north to fight some trainers to level Turtwig up as much as possible. Because unlike a bunch of the other games in the series, you have to face the rival for the second time before you fight a gym leader. The design choice is similar to making the Generation 1 optional rival battle a mandatory battle just before, let's say, Viridian Forest. Halfway through level 12, I figured that I was ready, so let's take on Barry. In this battle, he has a level 7 Starly and a level 9 Chimchar. Both of them only know normal type moves, so there is no super effective damage here. I was afraid of that when playing this run because I didn't know what his team's movesets were yet. His Pokemon share the levels that Blue's Pokemon have in the Rival 1A battle, so that is a helpful reminder. Notably though, they are switched. In that battle, his Ace is level 7 and his Lead is level 9, but in this case, it's the opposite. I finish off the Chimchar, level up to 13, and learn Razor Leaf. 
And this move gives me an appropriate chance to talk about the physical special split, perhaps the largest mechanic change that has ever occurred between Pokemon generations. In generation 1, 2, and 3, the move's type determines which set of stats are used to calculate damage. So for example, with a grass move, it's going to use your special attack and the opponent's special defense. Now the name physical special split does not really accurately describe the mechanic that was changed in these games. Instead of it being type determined damage category, we now have move determined damage category. So whenever the game uses a move, it checks if that move deals physical or special damage, and then uses the appropriate stats. In my current moveset, you can see that Absorb deals special damage, but Razor Leaf deals physical damage, which is fantastic because it utilizes Turtwig's higher attacking stat. Coming into this series, I really thought that the physical special split was going to be very hard for me to learn, but overall it hasn't actually felt like much of a challenge. My time spent playing the later Pokemon games casually has really taught me the damage category of most of these moves, and I also have a lot of software aids while I play. Once I reach Orberg City, there's this little guy who just has to talk to you and walk you five steps over to the gym. Why did they do this? You can explore the city yourself. I'm probably gonna complain a lot about little things like this throughout the initial videos in this series. Don't worry, it'll go away soon enough. After that I have to explore Orberg Mine, by the way the fastest path here, which I took from a speedrunning video. It was by Worcester by the way, so thank you Worcester for posting the video, it was very helpful for me to watch. By going over to the left I can jump over this ledge, pick up an escape rope, and then talk to Rourke, using the escape rope to leave the cave, walking on the minimum number of tiles, avoiding encounters. Next I head into the city's gym and face the two optional trainers, leveling Turtwig up to level 15. As the second battle ends, I'm going to draw your attention to another software glitch that I'm currently experiencing. I added a little indicator showing us the exact percentage that my Pokemon has towards its next level. In this case, Turtwig has 69%, but you will note that the experience bar is completely blank. This is a glitch. It's very frustrating. I wish it wasn't there. I still haven't really figured out why it's happening. I've corrected some of the behavior, but not all of it. Okay, so now with the grass starter, let's see if I can beat the rock type gym leader. Rourke's first Pokemon, like Brock, is a Geodude. Actually, saying that is kind of funny. Rourke is essentially Brock plus one. He also has an Onix, and then he gets a Kranidos, which is awesome by the way, because unlike Onix, it has a lot of attack. Razor Leaf on turn one, one shots the Geodude, so it does nothing to me, and then Onix comes in. This thing is very fast, but it takes a lot of damage from Razor Leaf and goes down. Last is Kranidos, it's also fast. It lowers my defense, removing the withdraw I set up earlier in the battle, and then Razor Leaf one shots. Okay, so that was an easy battle. Leveling up to 17, Turtwig has the chance to learn Curse, which of course I'm going to teach in the place of Withdraw. Unlike in Generation 2, this move is no longer a TM, so whenever I get access to it, it'll actually be interesting rather than being just a bland standard. With Rourke finished, I don't get any badge boosts or even useful TMs. He gives out Stealth Rock, which is not good for a solo challenge. That being said, there are some advantages to earning badges in this game, because now the Mart offers more items, so we can go there and pick up some repels. Once I get back to Jubilife City, of course, Looker stops me. This guy. And then, as soon as I go north of the city, there's another little cinematic that has to play out, where Professor Rowan talks for the longest time. I want everyone to look at the clock. We are approaching 21 minutes of real time played, and I have only got my first badge. As I go into this first double battle of the run, I'll draw your attention to a double battle specific glitch. My overlay is currently saying that all of my moves have a not a number power, which is just completely wrong. Again, a programming error I am responsible for. I'm very sorry. Following all of this dialogue, as soon as the NPCs walk away from the player character, another NPC approaches and just has to give you a fashion case. First of all, from a writing perspective, why is this guy just like waiting and then he walks up to you and he just gives you something? I don't know, this is a bit of a stretch to me. I really dislike this. A lot of people talk about the constant cinematics in Generation 7, but I very rarely hear people talk about that in Generation 4, and I think these games do just as much of it as in Generation 7. I think in the later Pokemon games, the reason it's very obvious is because the camera is dynamic because we have 3D environments. Inside of the Ravage Path, I'm going to teach Rock Smash to my HM user, and then I can go to the left-hand side and pick up the TM for Rock Tomb. While I can't teach this to Turtwig now, it is going to be useful later on when I evolve to a Torterra. And speaking of evolution, on the very next route of the game, I level up to 18, where my Turtwig evolves into a Grodal. 
Just before Floroma Town, on the left hand side between these two little gardens, I can pick up the TM for Bullet Seed, but this isn't going to come in useful during this playthrough because I think Razor Leaf is just much better. To this point in the run you will have noticed that I haven't used any held items. That's specifically because the player doesn't have access to any, but now all that changes because I can grab myself a Cherry Berry, an Oran Berry, a Chesto Berry, and a Pecha Berry. I'm going through the overworld movement in more detail in this video just because it is the first in a series. After collecting these berries, I go back to the little flower patch, I guess this is Floroma Meadow, and I'm going to fight two Galactic Grunts here. They're both quite easy for Turtwig to deal with, that gives me the works key, and now I can head to the Windworks for my first major battle that is plot related. This one is against Commander Mars, and in my own personal attempts to beat Platinum, this has been one of the hardest battles in the run. The Perugly is incredibly scary. That's also where I should mention the fact that Faint Attack is spelt incorrectly. In these games, it does have an A rather than an E. The game hook mapper that I made myself spelled this move incorrectly, so we have an incorrect type icon for that move. Zubat is first, it doesn't really do anything, and I knock it out using Return. Oh yeah, by the way, you get Return really early in these games. It is given to you by the Professor right after you nickname your Pokémon. Next is Perugly. It's very fast, he uses Fake Out, I flinch, and then he uses Faint Attack. That being said, it's not doing that much damage, and Return is doing decent damage to it. I really should be using Razor Leaf here, but either way, I managed to finish it off and take a victory over Commander Mars. Speedrunner mentioned to me that you can dodge all of the trainers on this next route, but I get caught by the first guy. I have to go back and heal before I proceed with the route. Inside the forest, I'm joined by Cheryl, who will heal my Pokémon after every battle. Notably, she does not heal your Pokémon before the first battle, which is kind of annoying, so you need to be careful that you have enough power points after the Valley Wind works to not get walled here by the first group of trainers. They have four Pokémon in total, but overall are not that difficult. Another thing to note is that since she is healing your Pokémon, this is a fantastic opportunity to do some training. There are a total of four pairs of double battles here, and you can take three of them on individually if you want. I'll be utilizing these battles in future runs, but in this case I'm not worried because there is a Grass-type gym leader next. Upon defeating the last mandatory trainer in the forest, I level up to level 22, where Grotal can learn Bite. Now in Generation 2 and 3, this move deals special damage. Of course, that doesn't make any sense, so the developers switched it to be a physical move starting in Generation 4. At the end of the forest, Cheryl departs, giving you the Soothe Bell, which can be useful to raise your Pokémon's friendship a little bit faster so that we can get to spamming Return as quick as is possible. Eterna City's next, and I'm going to go right for the gym, so let's face Gardenia. Her first Pokémon is a Turtwig. I'm going to talk about this in a later video, but for now, I'm just going to set up against it using Curse, boosting my attack and defense stat. Grotal is already quite slow, so I'm not worried about losing the speed, and once I hit plus 4, I am ready to attack. Return does just more than half to the Turtwig. It's chipped away at me for about a third, I finish it off, and then she sends in her Roserade. This thing knows the move Grass Knot, which deals damage based on your Pokémon's weight. Even though it's resisted, it does a decent amount to Grotal, but Bite is too strong and I take her ace out. All that's left is Cherum, and of course in this case, I one-hit. Okay, so I have earned myself a second easy badge, and with this one comes the TM for Grass Knot, which a lot of Pokémon can learn, by the way, it's not just for Grass types. Following the gym battle, I have to talk to Barry, and then to Cynthia, and then I go into the Team Galactic HQ. Imagine having to cut a tree down every day on your commute to work. I expected there to be a lot of mandatory battles within this building, but there are actually none except Commander Saturn. And for navigating the stairs, Speedrunner gave me a great tip. You always want to be going up the pair of stairs that has the little sign on the wall beside them. Commander Jupiter could be challenging here, her Skun Tank is quite intimidating. Because of it, I wanted to set up Curse so that I would do enough damage to knock it out easily. After getting plus one, I decided to attack, because the Zubat is dealing decent damage with Wing Attack. But I just don't quite have enough attack to knock it out in one hit, so it gets another Wing Attack taking me to orange health before the Skun Tank even comes out. Then it goes for Night Slash, followed by Smoke Screen lowering my accuracy, and while I don't miss, it survives on a sliver and gives me my first reset of the run. In the next fight I don't make the same mistake, I set up to plus two using Curse, and and then I knock the Zubat out in a single hit. I have more health this time, which is convenient. Return does almost half to the Skun Tank. It does lower my accuracy. I take it to a Sliver. It restores some health with a Citrus Berry, but Night Slash is not doing enough damage. After all, it is physical, so my boosted defense is helping out. As a result, I'm able to knock her ace out and take the victory. Now there are a lot of mini errands that I have to do that are required for progression. Picking up the Explorer Kit, getting the egg from Cynthia, and then grabbing the bike. 
After that I do something optional, backtracking to the forest to go to the old chateau. In here on floor one, if you go right through the back door and then go to the left, there is the first rare candy of the entire playthrough. I made sure to research the location of every single rare candy in the game, and I'm going to pick up as many as I think are viable throughout this first run. By the way, in Platinum there are so many rare candies, like way more than any other game in the series. I head south on Cycling Road, there is a path through here without battling trainers, but I just completely fumble and mess it up. As a result, I have to face Cyclist James, who has a Ponyta, and it does a lot of damage with Flame Wheel, taking Grodel down to 11 hit points. I do manage to win though, but I have to backtrack to the Pokemon Center in order to heal. On the other side of Cycling Road, we have the opportunity to get two more rare candies. The first one, by heading underneath Cycling Road into this little hidden cave. You actually cannot see the entrance to it because it is occluded by Cycling Road above it. That being said, I decided not to get this candy now. I'm going to come back here and get it later. Also in the same cave is the TM for Earthquake, but Grodel can't learn it, so I have to wait for Torterra. South of this area, I can go up onto this ledge and grab a hidden rare candy. Following that, I journey through Mount Cornet, seeing Cyrus on my way, he is angsty as ever. When did these games come out? I was probably listening to like the Black Parade and stuff like that at the time, so I don't know, maybe I get you Cyrus. On the other side of Mount Cornet, I pick up an ether behind these rocks, and then I've reached Heart Home City. In Pokemon Emerald, obtaining the Shell Bell takes a significant amount of time, but in these games, you can just go into the Pokemon condominiums, go up the little elevator, talk to this lady, and she will just give you the Shell Bell. I expect that we're going to see this item used a lot during these playthroughs because it recovers one-eighth of the damage dealt every time your Pokemon attacks. Following that, I have to have a bunch of dialogue in the contest area. Once again, another annoying cinematic. I don't want to completely complain though, because I am very grateful for the fact that they don't force you to do a contest. Okay, so now it is time for our third gym battle. Let's take on Fantina. Her first Pokemon is Duskull, and it knows the move Will-O-Wisp, which is not very prevalent in Generation 3. I didn't remember that this was on her moveset, so I'm using Curse to set up my attack. I want to deal maximum damage when I use Bite. Luckily the Duskull doesn't have a script to use the status on turn 1, so on my second turn I knock it out. Next, she sends in Miss Magius. By the way, the game does not display the enemy Pokemon's nicknames, but this thing has a nickname. Its nickname is Miss Maguire. I discovered this by complete accident, looking at the RAM while fighting Fantina testing my overlay. Maybe it's just a strange character entry mistake from the localization team, but I personally like to believe that this is a cute easter egg. As you can see, Grodel has been confused, and it hits itself three times in a row, giving me my second reset. In the next fight, the Duskull burns me as I try to set up more, so that cuts the damage from physical moves, which you can see reflected in the effective power of those moves. I'll also mention now that my overlay does display the status condition a Pokemon has, where the HP label should be. I make it past the Duskull, but the Miss Magus is just still too strong. I tried again, just going for plus one this time and then knocking the Duskull out. Maybe I can get better confusion luck when facing the Miss Magius. I also tried to set up against it to boost my attack a little bit more, and while this does allow me to knock out her ace, the Haunter that's next is faster, and as a result it puts Grodel to sleep and knocks me out. In the fourth fight, my grass type gets burned again. This apparently is not good for it. So I made the decision to try one more time, and if it doesn't work, I'll go and do some training. Going for plus one, I knock the Duskull out, move on to the Miss Magius. In this case, it confuses me, but I still hit with Bite, taking it to low red health. It heals with its Citrus Berry, doesn't do enough to Grotal, and I knock it out. Okay, Haunter, please don't put me to sleep. In this case, it goes for Shadow Claw, Bite hits, and I finish it off. So with that, I have earned myself the third badge. To this point, that battle was the most difficult one that I've had in this playthrough. Upon trying to leave Heart Home City, I am ambushed by Barry for another rival battle. Here I'll just mention that I think the rival in Generation 4 is quite competent. He is much better than Silver, as well as Brendan and May. Maybe he's on par with Blue from Generation 1. I also might consider him better than Blue in some instances. The Staravia in this fight can be very annoying using Double Team to boost its evasiveness, and then it can also use Endeavor to cut your HP once it's taken damage. For me though, I just set up with Curse and knock it out with a single return. Next, he sends in Monferno, which gets an attack in before surviving my return. This gives it one more Flame Wheel, which by the way is a physical move, so my defense setup is helping here. 
I knock it out, move on to the Rosalia, and it paralyzes Grodel. Because I mostly solo run these games, this is by far the worst status condition to have, but in this case it's not that bad because a speed cut once I've set up curse is not that impactful. I will note that my overlay is not currently calculating the paralysis speed cut, either way I would have moved second against his final two Pokemon. It doesn't really matter though because they're both very easy. On the next route of the game, there is a mandatory double battle, and then a spinner catches me. After her, I can pick up an ether, and then I go into Salacion Town, where I can grab myself my first person berries of the run. I'm also going to explore the optional ruins to pick up the defog TM, as well as a nugget and the mind plate. If you've never played Generation 4 like me, you're probably like, Mind Plate? What item is that? These are new type enhancing items that were introduced in Generation 4. For the longest time, I thought they only boosted uh, this thing's moves. By the way, I, I'm still unsure how to pronounce it. I think it's RKS, because like, RKS system in Generation 7. Anyways, I thought they boosted this thing's moves, but apparently they work for any Pokemon, so in this case the Mind Plate will boost the power of Psychic type moves by 20%. If you think that this is better than the Twisted Spoon, that is not in fact the case. Starting in Generation 4, all type enhancing items give a 20% boost instead of 10. This is one of the major pieces of advice that Speedrunner gave me. What this means is that these held items are going to be far more valuable in Generation 4 than they were in earlier generations. North of Salacion Town, I pick up a rare candy in the tall grass, and then I proceed towards Veilstone City. There are of course a few mandatory trainers here, and during one of the battles, my Grotal levels up to 32, and it evolves into a Torterra. If you're wondering why I didn't pick up the Earthquake TM earlier on, it's because upon evolution, I can now learn this powerful ground-type move. Move. With it on my set, I am ready for the next major battle, so in the Veilstone Gym, I go toe to toe with Maylene. Her first Pokemon is Metatite, and at this point, I think I should draw your attention to the enemy Pokemon move sets. They are so much better in Generation 4. In some cases, they feel a little bit too good. The Metatite has much better moves than Brawly's Metatite does just one generation prior, and then the Machoke as well as Lucario have decent coverage moves. Of course, my strategy is fairly simple, set up with Curse, boosting my attack and defense. This is going to mean I'm taking less damage from her final two Pokemon. I knock the Metatite out, and then she sends in Lucario. Drain Punch can't do very much to me, and of course Earthquake is going to one-shot this Steel-type. Last is Machoke, but it's not going to cause a problem, so I've earned myself the fourth badge. After this, I want to talk about the game corner. I pick up the coin case, and then head in to buy coins, and at this point in the run, after buying repels and all the other various items I need, I only have enough money to buy 500 coins. This is very notable because there are so many fantastic TMs that are unobtainable unless you buy them through the game corner. One of these notable moves, of course, is Rest, and another notable item that I have to buy is the Silk Scarf to boost Return's power. By the way, in this generation, there is no blank plate, so to boost normal type moves, you do need to purchase this item here. By the Team Galactic building, I pick up another rare candy, and then I head south, which is my first major mistake in this run. I'll talk about why in a little bit. For now, let's just go through this route. This section of the game, there are three distinct biomes. The top area, which is more treed and grassed, the middle area, which kind of feels like grease almost, and then the beach area. There are some notable items here, the TM for Dig, a rare candy which requires Surf so I can't get it yet, two Heart Scales, as well as the Aerial Ace TM. But I'll talk about their specific locations when they become relevant. Pastoria City is next, here I get access to more Person Berries, and I can also use the Move Reminder. In this case I figured that he would be useful right away, because Torterra has Wood Hammer as a starting move, which is a physical grass move with 120 power. Granted it does deal 33% damage in recoil, but I figured in combination with Earthquake can return, this move would be quite useful. After all, the next gym leader is Crasher Wake. Before I fight him, I have to defeat Barry, and uh, he won't battle me here, and that's when I realized I have to go back to Veilstone City and clear out the two grunts in front of the warehouse. This is the major mistake that I was referring to before, so I bleed some time doing all of this backtracking. And this is very ironic, because once I get into the warehouse, I get the HM for Fly. I guess it's nice that I can head back to Pastoria City very quickly and face the rival. I used my typical strategy here of setting up with Curse. This counters out the Intimidate that the Staravia hit me with. However, it still survives a hit from Return, uses Endeavor, taking Torterra to 21 hit points, and then he uses Wing Attack for the knockout. Okay, that did not go well, so I need enough curses so that I'm gonna one hit. With plus one in the next battle, I do, and from there his team is an easy sweep. I think of all the rival battles in the game, this one is probably gonna be most consistently the easiest. And speaking of easy, Crasher Wake is next. 
As the water type specialist in Pokemon Platinum, I did not expect very much out of him against my Torterra. His first Pokemon is Gyarados, it intimidates, lowering my attack stat. And then it flinches Torterra using Waterfall, and this move is also dealing a decent amount of damage. Plus, Wood Hammer does not even do half. As a result, I get a quick loss against his lead. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. I come back into the fight, thinking that I'll be able to do better, and the answer is no, I'm just going to lose to the Gyarados once again. In my third battle, I finally managed to take it out, but Torterra survives it with one hit point. This levels it up to 39, where it does get the chance to learn Synthesis. But because my speed has been cut, this isn't relevant because Floatzel comes out next and uses Aqua Jet, finishing Torterra off. I thought that I could just fight one trainer in the gym, level up to 39, teach Synthesis in the place of Curse, and then fight Crash Awake and win. Turns out that this strategy is much better. I'm able to make it by the Gyarados with green health and move on to his ace, Floatzel. And that's where I get crushed, because this thing knows Ice Fang, which deals four times damage to my grass ground type. I guess the uh, water type gym leader is actually going to be really difficult, so I should do some optional training to level up to 40. I'm just noticing this during editing. Look over on the right hand side of the screen. What is happening to the move names? They're all over the place. <laughs> Anyways, I'll have to fix that. At Crash Awake, I was hoping this would dramatically change things. The Gyarados is easier, and I survive the Floatzel's Ice Fang. My Earthquake does just over half, and then it heals with a Citrus Berry. So, it's gonna knock me out on the next turn. I still don't think I can win this fight. I come back to the fight after ironically using the Move Reminder to teach Curse in the place of Wood Hammer. This way, I can set up on the Gyarados, use Synthesis to heal, and knock it out in one hit. I have higher health now for the Floatzel. While it can hit one Ice Fang, I one-shot with my return. You will have of course noticed that I should be using Earthquake here. In the end, it doesn't really matter. I wouldn't have one-shot in the previous scenario, and in this case, Return did enough damage. Last is Quagsire. I don't forget the ground-type move here, and with that, I have defeated Wake. The plot continues after this battle, and I am stuck chasing around a Team Galactic grunt. I'll talk about this sort of game design later on in the series. Just know that I have to backtrack through this route many times. That isn't all bad though, because once you reach the hotel, there is a guy working at the desk who you can talk to and you will get a heal. This is a much faster heal than going into a Pokemon Center or even opening your inventory, so it's quite convenient. After defeating the Grunt, Cynthia gives me the Secret Potion, which allows me to cure the Psyduck's headaches and head north towards Celestic Town. My pathing is not yet perfect in this portion of the overworld. Speedrunner told me to immediately go to the right to dodge some trainers, but I did not go quite far enough to the right, so I run into one battle before I make it through this grass patch. The next route of the game is the first location where defog is required. It's kind of an interesting mechanical switch up to flash, because this field obstruction is not exclusive to caves. That being said, the reason I picked up the TM is because when you run into battles, if there is fog on the field, you immediately get minus one accuracy, and yeah, I really did not want to deal with that. This can be used to the player's advantage though if you have a move that bypasses accuracy checks. Of course today, with Torterra, that is not the case. As I'm just starting to get into the more mountainous terrain, I run into these two trainers, Double Team Zack and Jen. They have a Raichu and a Gyarados. Intimidate lowers Torterra's attack, and the Gyarados knows Ice Fang, so it knocks me out. I did not expect this random battle to be difficult, so of course I did not save. As a result, I am going to have to block out to continue with the playthrough. I really do not want to go back and have to beat Wake again. Of course, the lost money is a major disadvantage because I do want to eventually buy the TM for Swords Dance. I guess that advantage will just have to be pushed off a little bit further into the future. Upon returning to the location, I save successfully, but they still beat me one more time. Then I time my movement inputs a little bit better and successfully bypass them. In Celestic Town, I have to defeat a Galactic Grunt and then go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cyrus. He leads with an Ice-type, Sneasel, and it does no Ice Punch, which immediately does more than half to Torterra and freezes. Luckily, I thaw out right away and Earthquake one-shots it. Next is Golbat. I can use Synthesis to heal here, and then return to knock it out, which takes three hits because he healed using a potion. Murkrow is last, and it does no Drill Peck, which does a lot, but I managed to one-hit, so I am proceeding, but that fight was a little bit difficult. I'm starting to get worried about the last fight with Cyrus. I have heard 
but he is quite difficult. With access to Surf south of Veilstone City, I can pick up an extra rare candy. Also, the next destination is Canalave City. I think that's how I say it. There isn't really much to do on the way other than grabbing another rare candy. Once arriving in the town, there is this awesome bridge, and on it I have to battle my rival. This fight seems like another time when he is potentially going to be very challenging. All of his Pokemon are fully evolved, and he has a team of five. I do believe this is the first mandatory battle with a team this large. His lead is Star Raptor, which is annoying because it has Intimidate. Also, it is a flying type, so it'll be super effective against me. That said, I'm going to set up with Curse, and I can always use Synthesis to heal. While it will set up Double Team, I don't really care. I assume I'm going to be able to heal enough and eventually hit, which is what happens, and it goes down, leaving me with green health for the remainder of his team. With plus 5 attack, I am just going to have to survive a hit every turn. And that shouldn't be a problem because most of his Pokemon are physical attackers, with the exception of the Infernape, which actually has more special attack when compared with this physical attack. Also, I'll note another overlay mistake, Grass Whistle's type is not correctly calculating, and there is also some flicker occurring on the enemy's team. This is due to how the game encrypts data and stores it in party structures. It would be a full hour-long video for me to go through how that works. For now, it is sufficient to say that I am working on this issue, and it's a lot trickier to solve than you might think. So of course, Torterra defeats the rival, and with him out of the way, I am now headed into the gym to face Byron. Before that though, while I take on the puzzle here, I do want to mention that there are a lot of mandatory battles in this gym. If my Pokemon is weak to steel types or doesn't have good damage against them, I am imagining that this place is going to be awful. Arriving at Byron, I am now ready for the battle, so let's do this. His first Pokemon is Magneton, and despite what it looks like, it does not have Levitate, so Earthquake just one hits. Next he sends in Steelix. It has massive defense, so it's probably going to survive an Earthquake, and yes, it does on red. It strikes back with Ice Fang. Okay, that is a good coverage move. It does about a third, then Byron heals it to full. I take it back down to low health, but it doesn't get a chance to move again, so I knock it out. Last is Bastiodon, as a Rock Steel type, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen now. This thing takes four times damage from Earthquake, so I'm able to knock it out in a single hit and earn myself the 6th badge. It's mandatory to go to the Iron Island and talk to this guy to get the HM for strength. Following that, I got stuck in a really annoying battle with a ghost type. By the way, when these things have levitate, I have no moves that can damage them, so I have to deplete all of my PP and use struggle to take them out. Luckily, I can do this because I deplete all the other moves first and then synthesis last, so I have enough health and I don't have to black out. I fly back to Floroma Town because there are some important items that I want to pick up over here. Surfing west past the bridge, I can go to the northern part of the meadow, and in here I can pick up a miracle seed, as well as another rare candy. There's also a PP up here, but when recording this video, I didn't know that it existed. There's some required plot stuff next, I have to face Saturn in Lake Valor. Overall, this fight is not really that difficult. This one seems very similar to Matt or Maxi in Pokemon Emerald. There's another battle like this at Lake Verity. I want to mention here one interesting fact. The lake is more full when you arrive here during the plot than it was at the beginning of the game. At the beginning of the game, there is a cliff to get to the water, whereas here, you can actually just surf on the water and bypass some trainers, making it to Commander Mars a little bit quicker. Again, thank you speedrun runner for this amazing tip. Of the commander battles, I think Mars is probably more difficult. In this case, I do have more problems. The bronze ore is quite annoying. It takes a while to knock out. But finally, I do it, move on to the Purugly. It puts me to sleep, which was kind of scary, but Torterra wakes up, hits Earthquake, and gets a one hit. It is time to pass through Mount Coronet again, this time from the Celestic Town entrance. Using strength to clear this obstacle, I can then rock smash two boulders and pick up another rare candy. I haven't actually mentioned all of the rare candies I've been picking up in this video, just know there are a lot. In the very next floor of this area, there is another one, but before I grab it, I'm going to pick up the soft sand first. Then, as I'm about to exit the area, I find myself the hidden rare candy and proceed. Alright, I'm going to talk about game design overall and player experience later on. I do just want to say that this snowy area of the game was one of the most frustrating spots for me. Also, it's frustrating today because I get into a battle against Atropius, and it's doing so much damage, plus I'm getting hit by hail every turn, and I have a reset. Set. I come back into the fight and you might wonder why I didn't heal. The reason is there is a house where I can heal after this one trainer and I don't have any healing items left. So I didn't want to backtrack
trek all the way through Mount Coronet and lose all of that time, and then I would have to walk back to this location, which would take even more time. Locking through this battle was the most time-conscious choice I could make. Like I said, after being victorious, I can heal myself in this bed, and then proceed with the snowy portion of the route. On the theme of having a lot of rare candies available to me, directly horizontal to this house at the end of the route, I can grab myself one more rare candy, and then I make it to Snowpoint City, where, horizontal to the gym, there is another hidden rare candy. Inside the gym I have to solve a puzzle, and while I do that, I want to talk about Torterra's typing. Grass ground is actually pretty cool. I really like it as a typing because grass types are some of my favorite types and the ground type is fantastic offensively. Plus Earthquake itself is such a good move. Despite how much I like the typing, it has weaknesses to flying, bug, and fire and a double weakness to ice type moves. So how is Candice going to be? For first Pokemon is Sneasel, he goes for Ice Shard, doing about a third before I even get a chance to move. I've used Return, but it doesn't one hit. She uses a Hyper Potion, hits Ice Shard again, taking my Torterra to orange health before the Obama Snow comes out. Oh, there is a glitch with Woodhammer's name, it's taking up two lines because the text size is too big, so that's a mistake, I'll definitely have to correct that. Of course, I will also have to correct my strategy here because there is no way for my Torterra to win. I tried one more time, and the Obama Snow just completely crushes me, so I need a different approach. I return to the game corner to buy coins. In this case, I can just get 4,000, which is the perfect amount to be able to buy the TM for Swords Dance. While Ice Shard and Avalanche are both physical moves, and setting up Curse could be useful for the defensive boosts, I don't think losing speed is a good choice. Also, Swords Dance is going to allow me to set up twice as fast, and I think that's what's more important right now. Because of how much damage Sneasel is doing, I can set up once before knocking it out with Return. Then against Obama Snow, since I've maintained my speed, I will move first and one shot. Alright, everything is going so much better this time. But then Frostlast comes out, hits Blizzard, and knocks me out. I use Rare Candies, taking Torterra up from level 51 to level 60. If you expect the fight to change dramatically because of this, it is not going to. The Sneasel has 109 speed, I currently have 102 speed, and the Frostlass has 115. Once again, it just goes for Blizzard and knocks me out in a single hit. I used three more candies to go up to level 63 to see if this would change the outcome. I am still slightly slower than the Sneasel, but I arrive at the Frostlass with green health. That is much more encouraging. And then it one-shots me again with Blizzard. Are you kidding me? Okay, so a double weakness to ice types is really holding Torterra back right now. And this is where I need to take a step back as we watch a montage of me losing to the Frostlass using Blizzard. I'm going to explain what happened here because you're probably going to be very frustrated watching this footage if you know Generation 4 and 5. When I play these challenges, I'm always looking information up on, say, Bulbapedia to determine how certain moves work. That being said, there are a lot of generational differences between moves. One example of that is Low Kick, which in Generation 1 and 2 has a base power, and then starting in Generation 3, its base power is assigned based on the opponent's weight. When researching Generation 3, I distinctly remember looking up Blizzard and its interaction with Hail. I was curious if it was going to bypass accuracy checks similar to how Thunder does during Rain, and the conclusion of my research was that it doesn't. And that is correct. In Generation 3. Okay everyone, take a deep breath. The pain is going to be over soon enough. Starting in Generation 4, and then also present in Generation 5, Blizzard bypasses accuracy checks when Hale is on the field. However, this interaction was then removed starting in Generation 6. I guess they just thought that uh, ice types were too good or something. Anyways, from this footage, I hope that you can realize that I am waiting for Blizzard to miss. And because Candace is sending out her Obama Snow first, and its ability sets up Hail, Frostlass is never going to miss. It is always going to hit with Blizzard, and my Torterra is always going to faint because this ice move just does too much damage. Because Blizzard has 70% base accuracy, at some point I realized that things were just not mathematically making sense anymore. I paused my game, I went and researched the interaction, discovered that Blizzard is bypassing accuracy checks, face palmed for like five minutes, and then I had to come up with a different strategy. I made the decision to outspeed or at least speed tie most of her Pokemon. I trained some levels and I also grabbed more rare candies, like this one in the Great Marsh. 
By the way, you can only pick this one up if you are not stuck in the mud. Just for everyone watching, if you know these games better, you're probably thinking, why not grab the Quick Claw in the Jubilife Condominiums? Yes, I think that would be the fastest way for Torterra to defeat Candace. Just wait for the 20% chance to move first against the Frost Lass, and from there, you've probably won. With my approach at level 66, I have 115 speed, so now I'm going to be tied with the Frost Lass. I win the speed tie, hit Earthquake, and knock it out in one hit. Last is Pyloswine, I have green health, this thing's pretty weak, plus Torterra's pretty pissed, so Return gets a critical hit, and the Ice Pig faints. That gym battle took me from 13 resets up to 37. The timer is going to make it to 3 hours before I finish this game, and as expected, Generation 4 is going to be the longest games that I am currently playing on my channel. In the Team Galactic building in Veilstone City, I have to take on the boss, Cyrus. This is not the battle I was referring to as being difficult before. Also notably, all of his Pokémon are weak to rock moves. Speedrunner, thank you for that tip. I did not teach one for this fight. I figured it would just be fine using Return. He only has 3 Pokémon. Things get a little bit sketchy though, the Honchkrow takes me down to red health before I finish it off. To wrap up this area, I have to face Saturn. This fight is a lot easier than the one against Cyrus. Because of confusion and sword stance, it looks close, but it really shouldn't have been. And now it is once again time to enter Mount Cornet. This trip gives me access to a useful TM, which is Rock Slide. I'm gonna have Torterra learn this in the place of Giga Drain, then I will have three physical moves and Swords Dance to boost all of their damage. Plus, if we run a type effectiveness calculation on these three types together, they hit every single Pokémon for at least neutral damage. By the way, I do believe that that is missing the Bronzong line's Levitate ability, but other than that small exception, I think this is a fantastic set. In this area, I gain access to more rare candies. This one I have to go slightly out of my way and battle one optional trainer to obtain, but this one is along the regular path, so I'm always going to be picking it up. At the top of Mount Cornet, I have to take on a double battle, this one is mandatory, and Barry joins me in the fight with his Munchlax. Speedrunner told me that his Munchlax isn't very good, but the Pokémon he sends out after can be quite good, so I did debate briefly the idea of knocking the Munchlax out myself, just to get a little bit more of an advantage, but that does feel kind of against the spirit of the challenge, plus I can set up with Sword Stance and easily knock out all of these Pokémon. Okay, so with that, the plot really kicks into full gear, and Cyrus opens up the distortion world. As a player doing a casual playthrough, this area is so awesome the first time you go into it, but really on repeated attempts, it's just boring bloat. There are no wild Pokémon here, there are no items to pick up, there are just a bunch of overworld puzzles to solve, and once you know the answers, there really isn't anything left in this area other than the cool visuals. When completing this series, I beat Pokémon Platinum seven times in one week, so I got very used to all of these puzzles very quickly. That being said, there is at least something to do here, because after everything, we have to take on Cyrus. This is the final battle against him, and his team consisting of five Pokémon, which are all fully evolved, is very strong. First up is Houndoom, of course it is super effective with Flamethrower. I go for Swords Dance, but then it burns me, cutting my physical damage. I had to decide if I wanted to continue setting up to counter out the burn status, but then I would just take damage, so I decided to attack. It doesn't end up working because Weavile is very fast and Torterra goes down. Okay, let's try that again. If he doesn't burn me, everything should be fine. But this time the Houndoom gets a critical hit with Flamethrower, so Torterra can't survive the Weavile. In the third battle, the Houndoom continues being a problem, burning Torterra. Okay, maybe I should just attack right away and knock it out. I tried one more time with Swords Dance. This time it does not burn, and finally I knock it out, moving on to the Weavile with no status condition and green health. I survive its Ice Punch on orange health. I'm gaining back a little little bit each turn because of the Shell Bell, and next he sends in Haunch Crow. Despite being a bird, this big boss Pokémon is not very fast, so I outspeed with Return and that's enough to get the knockout. I didn't use Rock Slide just in case I missed. Next is Crobat, it's faster, flinching Torterra with Air Slash. Its next hit takes me down to 7 hit points, Rock Slide hits, and I knock it out. Okay, so all that's left is Gyarados, but it has Intimidate, so I have less attack to deal with it. Granted, my Torterra is level 70, so I should have enough damage. I go for Rock Slide, it connects, and Cyrus's last Pokémon faints. I did have problems in that fight largely because I was trying setup. I think I just should have tried to sweep right away. That would have been the better strategy, after all my Torterra is very overleveled. That being said, in Generation 
Division 3, if I was this overleveled against one of the team leaders, I would not be having any problems. So that is refreshing. It is nice to have challenging trainers in these solo challenges. The last thing to do in the Distortion world, of course, is to face Giratina. But by the way, you can just run away from this thing. I think that that is absolutely hilarious. I could, like Generation 2, force myself to defeat this thing, but it's only level 47. I'm obviously going to beat it. Someone is going to comment that this is inconsistent with my approach to Generation 2, and yes it is. This is not Generation 2. I make no attempt to be consistent between generations. If I did, all of the jank in Generation 1 would be so hard to deal with. Uh, it just makes my head ache thinking about it. With the plot concluded, I can head to Sunny Shore City and face Volkner, the final gym leader. As I'm solving the puzzles in his gym, I just want to mention that his Diamond and Pearl team is really weird. He has a Raichu, Ambipom, Octillery, and Luxray. It's honestly refreshing to see normal and water types on an electric type gym leader's team. I think I would enjoy the series much more if more gym leaders had diverse teams like this. However, within those games, it really draws your attention to just how limited the Pokedex is. For that reason, I am glad I'm playing Platinum. Overall, I think this is the definitive Generation 4 game. Okay, so now let's take on Volkner, and in this case, he does have a fully electric team. His first member is Jolteon. I don't expect to have any problems here because I'm a ground type. I set up Swords Dance once, and from here I should just be able to sweep. And yes, as expected, I one hit all of his Pokemon and take an easy victory. Just before the Victory Road waterfall, there is this walkable area where I can grab one more rare candy. Then inside the cave, the first mandatory trainer has a Blissey. Speedrunner mentioned this person specifically to me in case I'm using a special attacker. In that case, you really want to have a physical move so you can bypass its massive 116 special defense. Also, Softboiled has the wrong type on the overlay. Yeah, there's still a lot I need to fix. In the next area of the cave, there is one hidden rare candy that I can pick up. And then in the second to last area of the cave with the surfing ponds, if you loop around past these double trainers, which are running around and you have to kind of be skillful to avoid, there is another rare candy. So that's it. I'm not going to be collecting any more in this playthrough. Granted, my Torterra is already level 75. Before the league, I have to face Barry. And here um, we get his trainer art superimposed against his team. Don't worry, I uh, paused the game and I fixed this coding to remove that graphic. So there we go. Now we can see his team. Let's beat him. Because his Star Raptor uses Intimidate, I cancel it out with Swords Dance to get plus one attack as well. And from there, I go for the sweep. And Torterra is successful. His team of six is not enough to stop me. Even the Snorlax goes down to a single hit. With this achievement, I am now ready to take on the Elite Four. Up first is Aaron, the Bug-type specialist. He is one of my favorite trainers in the Pokemon series. I just love that we have a Bug-type Elite Four member. That said, with Torterra, after setting up Swords Dance, I can basically just sweep his team with my current set. Bertha is next. By the way, Rhyperior's graphic was not loading, so I fixed that before continuing. I expect that this battle is going to be extremely difficult for any Pokemon that are weak to ground. Of course, Torterra is not, and Earthquake gives me super effective damage against both her Golem and her Rhyperior. Her last Pokemon is Hippodon, and obviously I one-shot, so that's that. Let's move on with the League. Flint is next, he is a Fire-type specialist, and I should mention that in Diamond and Pearl, he has a Steelix, a Drifblim, and a Lopunny on his team. Um, yeah, doesn't make any sense, just like Volkner. If every trainer was like that, it would be awesome, but it just draws attention to the fact that the only two Fire-types you can get are Rapidash and Infernape. Now, Torterra is weak to his Pokemon, but with Swords Dance and Earthquake, I'm gonna sweep all of his team members. Last in the Elite Four is Lucian. Of all of the members, I think he is the most forgettable for me. I never have had a problem with him doing playthroughs. I'm really curious how all of you feel about him. Has he caused you problems in the past? As a kid, did you find yourself walled here? I bet the answer is no. His most annoying Pokemon is Bronzong. Of course, I have to hit it with Return. That is the most damage I can deal to it per turn. With it out of the way, I one-shot the following Alkazam and the Gallade, and I have made it to likely the most difficult champion of them all. For the first time on the channel, let's face Cynthia. 
Her lead Pokemon is Spiritomb, and in all the playthroughs I've done so far, it has always caused so many problems for me. Mostly because its typing, Ghost Dark, is not weak to anything except the Fairy type. Of course, that doesn't exist in Generation 4, so this thing just has no weaknesses. That said, there is a piece of speedrunner advice here that is very important. The Spiritomb might be defensively outrageous, but it can't really do that much damage, so just set up against it. I take Torterra to plus 6 attack, and then I begin my sweep. Spiritomb goes down to a single Earthquake, Cynthia sends in Togekiss next. Here, I do want to note its moveset, Air Slash, Aura Sphere, Water Pulse, and Shockwave. Again, very diverse and much better than any former generation. Of course, Torterra one hits, I move on to her Milotic that's next. It has an equally diverse moveset, including Ice Beam. That said, my Tortoise is faster, and it knocks it out, so I'm not going to take Ice-type damage. She chooses to send in her Ace next. This Garchomp is so difficult to defeat when you're using multiple Pokémon on your team. But when all the experience, training, and rare candies are focused on one Pokémon, I am level 84 against a level 62 pseudo-legendary. And Torterra doesn't have problems taking it out. Earthquake 1 hits the following Lucario, and all that's left is Rose Raid, which I easily clean up using Earthquake. In my first ever solo run of Pokémon Platinum, I have beaten the game in 3 hours, 38 minutes, and 47 seconds. With 40 resets, at level 84 with a game time of 8 hours and 57 minutes. When I sat down to do this challenge, I budgeted myself 5 hours of playtime, which is roughly 6 to 6.5 six hours of recording time, because of small breaks to get snacks and water, as well as to uh, take care of my cats. So my time is much lower than I expected it to be, and I think I can really thank Speedrunner and my planning for these results. By far the most important thing was memorizing all of the rare candy locations, that meant that I didn't have to do that much optional training. That said, even with them, Torterra was really held back by its weakness to Ice-type Pokémon, but more so my neglect of the Quick Claw. I'm sure this run will be really fun when I come back to optimize it in the distant future. Okay, so as the credits roll, let me talk about what's coming up in this series for all of you over the next week. Yes, I will be doing seven back-to-back -back Pokemon Platinum videos. And then, starting on January 1st, I will be taking a planned month off from releasing produced videos. During that time, I'll be doing a lot of re-attempts in yellow on stream, so tune in to see those if you're curious. At the beginning of 2023, I sat down and I planned out how I wanted to release all of my Fire Red videos. When I did that, I found that planning the runs, starting with Pokemon obtained early into the game, leaves a lot of the really powerful, exciting Pokemon on to be done later on into the series near its conclusion. Personally, I really like this dramatic arc, and so I'm also going to be using it here in Pokemon Platinum. You might have wondered why I decided not to start this series with Butterfree. That has been how I've started every other new game on the channel to date. I felt that it was fitting to break from this pattern because I don't have any experience playing Generation 4, so the games felt very new, and because of that, I just wanted to start playing them with the starter Pokemon. As a result, tomorrow we are going to get an Infernape playthrough, and the following day I will be using Empoleon. And I don't think that stopping there is correct because there's kind of an honorable mention for a starter Pokemon in Generation 4. Of course, it is the electric type Luxray. Every time I play through Platinum, it seems that I have the starter Pokemon as well as Luxray on my team, and so on the fifth day of this series, I will be using another Pokemon that is generally omnipresent on teams. Following that, I need to end the series and the year with a bang, so things are going to get kind of legendary. I hope you have been enjoying Daily December. Of course, tomorrow it continues. Thank you so much for the support. It really means the world to me. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in the next video.